Well, good morning, Cornerstone. How are you doing this morning? I am away on vacation. Sandra, myself, and Luke, Hannah, and Matthew are away, but we're so glad that you're here today. If this is your first time here, welcome to Cornerstone. My name is Eric Bucci. I'm the pastor of this church, the lead pastor, and the reason Cornerstone Church exists is to help people come to know God, to find freedom, to discover purpose, and to make a difference in the world. And one of the ways we make a difference in the world is by supporting tremendous missionaries from Indonesia to India to South America to right here in Connecticut. And a tremendous ministry is called Chi Alpha. And right at Yale University, there's a ministry called Chi Alpha, and it is run by Rob and Sarah Malcolm. They have two beautiful children. They've been there for three years, and they're doing a great job. Yale University is, as you all know probably, is a very influential university. More than two U.S. presidents have been through that school, world leaders in all sorts of business and education, and they have a tremendous opportunity to make a difference in the world, and we get to partner with them on a monthly basis, so we're so glad about that. And I'm just so excited this morning to have Rob to share with us what the Lord has put in his heart. He'll be sharing a little bit about Chi Alpha and what's going on and how we're making a difference together. Would you please welcome to Cornerstone Church, a big, warm Cornerstone Church welcome to Rob Malcolm. Good morning. How are you? Don't you love the weather in March? Last week it was 70. Wind chill this morning, minus 3. What? Well, it's great to be with you this morning. Uh, my name is Rob Malcolm, along with my wife Sarah and our two kids. We are Chi Alpha missionaries at Yale University. Now, it's funny, people will say Chi Alpha. What is it? Chai Alpaca? Chai Alpha? Who are you? So our movement, we are the outreach to the secular campuses of America. We are called Chi Alpha. We're on over 300 campuses in the United States and also around the world. And people ask us, well, how did you get your name? And we're like, yeah, our name is not good. Because people are like, you guys are a frat. No, we're not. We're not. We have a Greek name, but we're not a frat. It comes from in 2 Corinthians when Paul talks about us being Christ's ambassadors, the Christus Apostoli, the Chi Alpha. And that's who we are. We are Christ's ambassadors to the universities and colleges of America. And what makes us distinctly different is that we have what you may say is a Pentecostal or spirit-led edge. That's who we are. So I want to say, first of all, thank you so much for your sacrifice in prayer and finance. You allow us to be the hands and feet of Jesus at Yale. And we are so grateful that you help us to be those people, and yet you never really see or reap the reward. And I think actually that's a great thing that you are able to do that. So we are so grateful for each of you. Uh, greetings from my wife. She's not here. She's currently flying back from the Midwest. She was at a Chi Alpha reunion last night in Kansas City. So she's flying back. So I'm flying solo with both of our kids. That's not a good thing. Okay, the kids keep on saying, when's mom home? Soon. So they're both in your kids' church. So if a number comes up starting with KF, I have to leave just so you know, and get my kids, okay? Tell, let me tell you a little bit about Chi Alpha. So as I said, we're on 300 campuses. We just at the start of January had what's called the World Mission Summit 4. It was the fourth time we did this. We do it every four years. And in Houston, Texas, 6,000 Chi Alpha students and missionaries came together for three days. And in those three days, there was a challenge. Give a year and pray about a lifetime. We were challenging students to take one year when they graduate and become a missionary for one year. And in that year, to pray and ask God, is this who you call me to be? And it was unbelievable. We had over 2,000 students choose to give a year. 2,000 students, when they graduate, are going to become missionaries around the world and in this nation. But what was also neat was we also asked them, how many of you will support a missionary financially? Now, students don't have money. Over 2,000 students picked up a card and said, I'm going to support a missionary on a monthly basis. It was just an unbelievable time. We really believe we are praying and seeing a great student awakening. Did you know that the big revivals that we've had in the past, like the Haystack Revival and so many others, do you know who started them? Students. We are praying that they will change the nation and they will change the world. 
So let me begin this morning by telling you a story that you may recognize. Here is a typical day for us as a family. We go to bed exhausted at night. At some point in the night, one of two of our kids is probably going to wake up having had a bad dream. Not every night, but fairly regularly. Now, if it's our daughter, you hear her cry, you go into the room, you comfort her, she's fine. If it's our son and he's had a bad dream, he comes into our room like a train. He busts the door open. He comes in right up to our, my side of the bed and goes, I had a bad dream. It freaks me and my wife out so much because we're in such a deep sleep that we give him a fright when we scream at him. Oh, okay, okay. So we go, we settle, we put him back to bed. I come back to bed. What do I do? It's 2 a.m. I check my email. I check my email, check my text because my phone's right there. Check Facebook, check Instagram, check Twitter, check group me. Go back to sleep. About an hour later, I'm going to wake up because there's something on my mind, something I'm dealing with. I've got some sort of anxious or stressful thought. So I'm awake for another hour thinking about that. Hey, I may as well check my phone, check my email, check my Twitter. I get back to sleep, and then at 6 a.m., the alarm goes off, and I feel so refreshed for the day. And then it's, it's Team Malcolm. Me and my wife, we get up. She makes, the bre- she makes the lunches for the kids. I get breakfast organized. 7 a.m., they come thundering down those stairs. Uh, do you know, uh, kids, no matter how late they go to bed or how much they're up at the night, they still get up at the same time. How can they do that? And then they always come up, they're kind of perky, and I'm like, how can you be so awake after last night? And they're like, what happened last night? You were up for half the night. And so we get them organized, number one son gets on the bus to school, and number two daughter gets the the ride to preschool. And I check my email, I check my phone, I check everything, I check text messages, I check Twitter. Then I come in, and I sit down, and I get ready for the day. And I look at my computer, I look at my Gcal, my Google Calendar, and I'm like, Where have all these appointments come from? Wait a minute, I put all those appointments on there. And then suddenly it starts to give me all my reminders for the day. My computer, bing, bing. I'm like, who put all these reminders on? It was me. I have no one to blame but me. I put all the appointments on the the calendar. I did all the reminders. And I progressed through my day. And about every five minutes, I check my email. I check text messages. I check my phone again. And then it gets to the end of the day, and I come home, or we both come home, and it feels like it's like a military operation. Okay, who is taking Cameron to soccer? You are great. Okay, high five. You take, I'll take Lily this way. Okay, when will we rendezvous back here? Dinner? Okay, great. And go. And we do the various things, and then we get the kids home, and they get bath. And at 8 p.m., they're in bed, and we collapse, and we're like, what just happened? And for the next however long, we sit at the TV like this. And then it's time for bed and repeat. Is that just my day? Can I get an amen? Don't you feel a bit like a hamster on a wheel? And repeat, and repeat, and and that's it. That's life. We repeat, we repeat, we repeat. What about this story? There's a story told of early African converts to Christianity that they would be very devout in their spiritual practices of scripture reading and of prayer. And what they would do is they would leave their villages And they would walk out through the thicket and make a prayer spot that would be their prayer place. And every brother would have their own prayer place. And that's where they would go to pray and spend time with the Lord. But what would become obvious is even though these are well-worn paths over time, if the grass began to grow on the path. Because that was a sign that they were not praying so much or going out. And so one of the brothers would gently and kindly say, the grass grows long on your path, my friend. The grass grows long on your path. And that was just a gentle reminder of, hey, where's prayer? Now, I don't know about you, but when I look at my day and I listen to that day, I'm like, I know which day I would rather have. It wouldn't be mine. It wouldn't be mine. I would rather I had the other day. You know, and as I said, you might laugh when I tell that first story. And I think we laugh because we all relate, don't we? It's like the to-do list never ends. The things we have to do on a daily basis, they go on and on. And we're the hamster on the wheel today and the next day and the next day. And before we know it, we're like, where did the year go? But hey, we get to do it all over again. You see, we live in a culture that has the idol of busyness. It's an idol. 
if you ever speak to someone, you're like, how's your day going? And if they ever say to you, do you know, really great, I have nothing on today. We're like, oh, well, well, what are you doing with your day? Because, see, the culture has taught us, well, they can't be that important because they're not busy. But you speak to someone else, and they're like, oh, my goodness, I've got this and that, and then the kids have got this and that. And we're like, wow, you must be important. Now, we may not vocalize it, we may not realize it, but it's in here. Because the culture values doing. The culture values busyness. It's what we've bought into. I often think of it like this. We have no priorities today. Why? Everything is a priority. We don't know how to prioritize. It's just everything. Everything has to be done, so we, we try and do everything. And at the end of the day, we're exhausted. And then I think to myself, how long is the grass on my path? How long is the grass on my path? Because often what is the first thing we push out? Time with Jesus. It's almost like we become a one-minute prayer person. We, all right, okay, I can squeeze in one minute right now, God. Okay, how are you doing? Great. High five. Awesome. And off we go. God, I might try and catch up with you at 10 tonight. Is that okay? We'll try again. Round two. Okay. Then 10 o'clock comes. In Jesus' name, amen. Is it just me? Our spiritual life is not the priority. Just the list and the tea becomes the priority. So this morning, let's look at a beautiful Jesus story. Where Jesus shows us, without even using the words, you got to change. The priorities got to be different. Let's begin in this part of the story. This is in Mark 1, verses 32 to 34. Mark 1, 32 to 34. Jesus has been doing all day, and let's, let's see how Mark finishes his day. That evening at sunset, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons. Sunset. I want to go to bed. And the whole city was gathered around the door, and he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. Oh, my word. Jesus has been busy all day doing the great things, ushering in the rule and reign of God, what we call the kingdom, the rule and reign, showing us how it's going to be. And at the end of the day, they're like, hey, Jesus, here's more people. Let's go. And all these people come in, and Jesus has to continue with the doing, the great doing that he was called to. You see, Mark's shown us something. He's shown us this. Jesus' to-do list was no different from ours. It was constant. It was do, do, do. He was no different from us. And this is how Mark sets up this story. He's trying to show us something. Look, Jesus was busy. His day was full. But then we come to the key passage we're going to look at today. Mark then tells us this. In the morning, while it was still very dark. Now, let's be honest here, people. If it's still dark for me, that's not often morning. That's the middle of the night. This is probably about 4 a.m., in the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, everyone is searching for you. He answered, let us go on to the neighboring towns so that I may proclaim the message there also. For that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in the synagogues and casting out demons. Let's pray. Father, we pray today as we come around this scripture that you, by your spirit, will change us. It's not by might. It's not by power. It's by you, Holy Spirit. So, Holy Spirit, we invite you today. Come speak to us and speak through us. You are welcome here, Holy Spirit, to change us. There can be no just on another Sunday. If that were the case, we should leave. Holy Spirit, come. Speak to our hearts, we pray. Let us be more like Jesus. Amen. So, 
I think this story, we can see three really simple applications for you and me that speak to our life in the 21st century as we bow down to the idol of busyness, where every priority is the priority. Let's look at the first thing we can see in this passage. Jesus intentionally went to pray. Jesus intentionally went to pray. See, here's the deal. What's Mark telling us? Your life is no busier than Jesus. We get to the end of the day and we're tired so often. So did Jesus. He got to the end of that day and he was tired. I've no doubt. If we believe that God, Jesus is fully God and fully human, which we believe, then we can say that with all respect, he was probably pretty tired at the end of that day. The physical Jesus was tired. He'd been doing all day. So if it was you or me, I think we'd be resetting the alarm going, oh, maybe an extra 30 minutes. Hallelujah. Hit the snooze button three more times. Amen. Because we're tired. Because we're so busy doing. That's what Mark sets up. But what does Mark tell us in this story? That in the midst of the tiredness and probably just the giving out in ministry that he was doing, something in him said, I got to get up to be with my father. I've got to get up and be with my father. He knew something about prayer that I want to learn. He knew that in spite of everything else, this was the most important thing. This was priority number one. Now, it's interesting the way that Mark describes the prayer. He, he gives us some good descriptive terms. It was dark. It was early. I love that because we don't live in that world. We live in a world of noise, don't we? We always have noise in the background, either ambient or right in front of us, but there's noise in our life. And yet Mark is saying to us, leave the noise, go to the quiet place. Leave all of this, get yourself away. It was quiet, it was dark. Can you imagine those moments that Jesus had with his father, the son to the father in that darkness and quietness, I think it would blow my mind. The communion, the intimacy, the conversation. Prayer is conversation with God. It's dialogue. It's talking with your father. So here's Jesus in the quiet, in the dark, having that beautiful moment. So the question comes to us, do we do the same? Many of us have heard of Susanna Wesley. She was married to Sam Wesley, and she was the mother of John and Charles Wesley. And for those of us who don't know the story, John and Charles Wesley literally saw millions of people come to faith in Jesus. But Susanna Wesley did not have an easy life. Her and Sam had 19 kids. Ten of them survived, nine died. Two of them were permanently sick. She was often sick in her life. And her and Sam fought constantly. In fact, he would often leave her with the kids for weeks or months at a time over an argument. They had no money. They were incredibly poor. If you were the mother of 10 kids at 1.19, you've got the greatest to-do list ever. Amen? Amen. Let's be honest. Yet often many of us know this part of our story. In the midst of the noise, in the midst of the busyness of this family, she would throw her apron up over her head. And the kids knew, mom's praying. And she might be under that apron for an hour. But the kids knew, back away. In the midst of to do and busyness, this woman knew something about prayer that we need to grasp. She couldn't afford the time, let's be honest, to pray. Ten kids, you're poor, you constantly have to work the land. Yet in the midst of it, she would throw that apron up over her head into her quiet place and commune with the Father. She knew a secret of prayer that we need to learn. She would have that intimate commune with the Father 
It was her prayer spot. You see, we live in a culture where priorities dictate our day. But as we're beginning to see for Jesus and for Susanna Wesley, prayer dictated the priorities. Prayer dictated the priorities. How green is your path? Let's go to the second observation we can make in this scripture. Competing priorities will find us and will remind us of what needs to be done. See, here's the deal. Everything that Jesus had done that day before was what he was called to do. That's what he was doing. He was showing the rule and reign of God. None of this was bad. I reckon that if we were to look at your to-do list and just your daily day, none of it's bad. It's just all there. So here we have this story. Jesus leaves that. He goes to this quiet place. Now, where he went would be a common place of prayer because around the villages at that time, there were places of prayer. So it wasn't hard for the disciples. When they got up the next morning, they're like, hey, where's Jesus? Oh, he must be out praying. Let's go find him. They would just go methodically to each of the prayer spots, knowing that eventually we're going to happen. And they find him in prayer. Now think about it. Let's stop for a minute. This was their rabbi. And by this point, they knew he was different. There was something different about this man. He was doing all these miracles. So here he is in prayer. Okay, let's look at an analogy. You imagine Pastor Eric's in his office, clearly praying. Do you just walk in? Boom. Hey, Pastor Eric, can we talk? Of course you wouldn't, but the disciples did. He was in that place of prayer. They found him, and they go, Jesus, we've been looking everywhere for you. Everyone's asking after you. They had no respect for the rabbi. They just went in because they wanted, to, they wanted to pull him back into the day. They wanted to pull him back to the to-do list, to the priorities, because everything was good. Let's go do these good things again. Come on, Jesus, let's go do these good things. Everyone is searching for you. Come on, remember all the miracles yesterday? Hey, let's keep doing them. Yet something had changed. Look at this quote by C.S. Lewis. This is, I, I just love this quote. The moment you wake up each morning, all your wishes and hopes for the day rush at you like wild animals. And the first job each morning consists in shoving it all back and listening to that other voice, taking that other point of view, letting that other larger, stronger, quieter life come flowing in. Hallelujah. That's it, folks. It's the stop. Susanna Wesley knew it. Jesus lived it. The day wants to rush in and fill you up with the to-dos and all those things. And it's like, no, I'm going to go this way. I'm going to pray. I'm going to have communion with God. And in those moments, I don't know about you, but even when I go into prayer, I bring my to-do list with me. <laughs> it's still there, just like this quote. It's a, come on, come on. We, are, we don't have time for prayer. Come on, come on. You got to do, you got to do. Come on, come on. Or there's anxious and there's stress. And, and in the midst of this, we see Jesus in that quietness, in the darkness, listening, talking, being still before the Father. The day was pushed out. The to-do list was not there. The question comes to us, what about us? How green is your path? Do your priorities drive your day? Or does prayer drive your priorities? Here's the final thing we see in this story. Spending time in prayer changed Jesus' priorities. The task remained the same. Usher in the rule and reign of the Father. But the location changed. He could have went back. Because like everyone was like, hey, this is great. Jesus does all these miracles. Come on, do it again, do it again. And that's what the disciples wanted. Everyone is looking for you. Do it again. 
But no, he says, let's go this way. We're going over here. The allure of success is here. It's proven, but Jesus is like, no, we're going to go this way. I wonder if the disciples were like, yeah, we've not been there yet. We don't know if they're going to be nice. We like these people. They like you. Let's just stay here. It's known. It's good. He's like, no, we're going to go this way. Jesus says no. The priority changed. Prayer drove the priorities. We live too much with the priorities, cancelling prayer. We don't even get to the line. We just don't have time to pray. Yeah, here is Jesus showing us beautifully. Do you know what? Yeah, you do. Change it round. Look at what E.M. Bounds said about prayer. The central significance of prayer is not in the, the, the things that happen as a result, but in the deepening intimacy and unhurried communion with God at his central throne of control in order to discover a sense of God's need in order to call on God's help to meet that need. I love that quote. He's telling us this. When you go into that place of prayer, you take in your day. That's okay. But let God speak to it. Let God show you the need. Let God show you the priority and orientate around that. Surrender your prayer, your priority, and pick up his. Because when you do that, you have confidence in your day. You have confidence because you prayed, and the priorities roll out of that confidence. Let's try and wrap this up then. What about us today? Let's talk about us. I think we can relate to Jesus. Amen. Do, do, do. That's all we're taught to do is do, do, do. You're not valued for your being. You're valued for your doing. So we buy it and we work it out in our life. Does that mean the things are bad that are in our day? Not at all. They're most likely all good things. Many of them important. But if the priorities cancel the prayer, something is wrong. Here's the second thing I think we can see in this story. Jesus shows us the significance and centrality of prayer. Too often you've stayed in the shallows in prayer. And so prayer isn't that great or exciting because really we haven't dove deep. Get out the shallows of prayer. Go deep in the water where you cannot support yourself and you have to rely on God. Go so far out, swim so far out in prayer that you're like, God help me. The more time we spend in prayer, the more we commune, the more the intimacy grows. Yeah, but I don't feel like praying. That's awesome. I don't care. If you're waiting for the, this is, now I say this all the time to students at Yale. If you're waiting for the feeling to lead to the action, forget it. Act your way to a feeling. Do it and then the feeling will come. Do not wait for the feeling before you do. You're going to be there for a long time or you're going to be up and down like a yo-yo. Do it as a discipline. That's why they're called spiritual disciplines. Yeah, but that sounds really constrictive, and I don't like the idea of discipline. Here's another story I always tell students when they say that to me. I often they'll say, hey, you play an instrument. What instrument do you play? The piano. Awesome. Did When you were learning to play the piano, was it just because you felt like it? Oh, no. My mom would be like, you're learning. Go practice your scales. Right. Play a piece for me, and it's beautiful. I'm like, you know what? Discipline brought you freedom. Discipline brought you freedom. Isn't that ironic? We live in a culture that says, if I feel like it, I'm free. No, you ain't. You're bound. You're bound. But the more you discipline yourself, ironically, the more free you become. So discipline ourselves in prayer. 
discipline ourselves in scripture. Discipline ourselves in meditation on scripture. Discipline yourself in silence. There's one we can't do in our culture. Well, I could do it for like 15 seconds. Then I'm like, whoa, that was great. Whew. Discipline yourself. Discipline yourself. And with discipline comes freedom. That was a freebie. That wasn't in my notes. You see, when we grasp the significance of prayer, when it guides our day and guides our priorities, the to-do list, the, the barking of the day that's constantly at us, we're suddenly like, not you, not you, not you, yes, you. Or it might be, hey, no, I'm going to go this way. Now, I'm going to put one caveat in here. That does not mean we say, hey, kids, we're not going to go to soccer practice anymore because, you know what, I've got a new, ah, no, 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 no. There are still things we got to do but we're cutting out maybe too many of the to-dos. And if prayer has not been in our list, it becomes the center. How green is your path? When you pray, is it a lucky charm that you rub in the morning? Well, okay, here's my, here's my little lucky charm. I prayed for two minutes so God's with me. I'm going to prosper. Really? Wow, you haven't even got your feet in the water. You're missing so much. Let me finish by telling you about Yale and prayer. So as Pastor Eric said, Yale is a very significant campus. Four of our former presidents, three of our current Supreme Court justices, all graduated from this school. Every year it produces thousands, and I mean thousands of people that will affect your life on a daily basis. Yet about one in 30 love Jesus. And God has called us to be salt and light and truth to these students. It's not a very good picture, but that's my wife teaching. Our room is now too small. We can't fit in that room anymore. We have to move. Our Bible studies are bursting at the seams. And people will say, what's your secret? Why, why are you having all this success? And our honest answer is, we have no idea. It was not the plans of man. We've done some things to, to make it seem nice, but really, we did the same last year and we didn't see that much growth. What's happening? And all I can say is, is a gracious God and prayer. We pray and we pray and we pray. And God does his thing. We pray that he would win the battle. He would go before us. We pray that he would save. We pray that he would heal. He would redeem. He would revive. He would restore. We pray that he would tear down the strongholds at my campus. There's a library at Yale called the Stirling Memorial Library. And as you enter it, it's just been refurbished, it's beautiful. But at the back wall, there is a, a fresco and it's called Alma Mater, Mother Knowledge. And it basically says, oh, that you would leave your mother and allow me to nourish you. And everything bows before her. Truth, light, everything bows before knowledge. That's a stronghold on my campus. So every time I see it, I'm like, no. In prayer, I pull you down. In prayer, I cast you out. That Jesus will be number one in the hearts of my students. That you will bow to him. Knowledge but only by prayer. Now, sometimes we get it right in prayer. Sometimes we don't. But the discipline keeps me going. So this year, our numbers have doubled. But we don't go by numbers. We go by what Jesus is doing in the hearts of these students. We are seeing students come to our meeting who have no faith. I mean, none whatsoever. And they're coming back week upon week and then they're coming into our core groups and we're like what are you doing God 
We're seeing students who admire Jesus finally realize that's all they have, but they now want to love Jesus. And we have students who have loved Jesus all their days and want to know him more. And we're seeing this campus slowly begin to be one for him. That truth and light would reign once more at Yale. But it only happens by prayer. By going to that quiet, dark place. This morning, what about you? How green is your path? Are your priorities canceling out prayer? Or is prayer ordering your priorities? Let's close our eyes. And let's ask the Spirit of the living God to speak to us today. To open our eyes to see. To open our he ears to hear what he would say. Holy Spirit, come. Woo us and draw us back to the Father through prayer. Birth the discipline of prayer in our life. Reveal to us the power of prayer. God, forgive us when we choose everything else but prayer. And bring us to that place where we experience such communion and intimacy with you that it's the very thing we crave is to pray because of what we experience in those places. Holy Spirit, birth in our hearts, we pray today. To lift up the Son and glorify the Father. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Folks, thank you so much. It really is a privilege and an honor to share with you today. God bless you. Stay up here. Do this again. You know, I've been in campus ministry for uh, for several years uh, at Southern. I uh, was the, camp, uh, was the uh, chaplain for the football team, so I know where he's coming from. There's a lot of things out there that are competing against Jesus. Amen. I want to know, how many college students, when, raise your hand if you're a college student right in this room right now. Raise your hand. Hi, hi, hi. All right, now I want you to stand up get over here right now. Just get out of your seat right now. Come on, let's go right now, right now. Come on up here. Come up right on the stage. How many seniors in high school do we have? Raise your hand. Seniors in high school. Come on up here right now. Come on up. I want you to get close to this guy. I want you, oh, you can get on your first today. Put your hands on him. We're going to pray him. Brian, you come on in here. Hey, this is our future. More than our future, this is our present. Amen. These folks are our present. God's using them, and I pray right now that, amen, you guys. With all that's within you, I want you to pray for this man right here, Rob. Father, in the name of Jesus, we so thank you for his ministry. Why don't you all raise your hands to him? Father, pour your spirit out upon him, Lord. We believe in the Holy Spirit. We believe, Holy Spirit, that you can come down and, and, and give him strength and give him wisdom and give him understanding. But most importantly, give him your love, Lord God. Give him your love. That his heart would break and his wife's heart would break for the people that he has under him and, and, and alongside of him. Father, as we gather together with the, the students, Lord, we pray just an endued power and anointing that will come upon him. To lift him up when he is down. Father, to slow him down when he's going too fast. And Father, to just to ha have that still, small voice guiding every step that he takes. And Father, we just stand in agreement with him that the campus of Yale will, will, will have revival. Lord God, that the, power, uh, that the powers of this dark world would subside and, and the power of Jesus and the light of Jesus would, be, would permeate through those halls. Lord God, that your anointing would come. And, Father, they would see signs, wonders, and miracles, Lord. And the biggest and greatest would be those that would re receive Jesus Christ. We just give you the honor, and we thank you so much for that right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Father, you are good. 
And your mercies certainly endure forever. And we thank you so much for all the things you're doing. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Can you give God praise for Rob? Thank you, man. Bless you. Oh, Father. Amen. As we continue to pray, put your heads bowed and your eyes closed. This is uh, for all of us to pray. You know, he's talking about listening to the still small voice in prayer. There might be some in this room today that you can't hear that still small voice because you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You might know of him, and even as Rob said, you might be impressed by Jesus. You might see him in the, in, in the distance, but you know what? Jesus can be as close as your skin. It says in God's word, it says, for all have fallen short of the glory of God. There's not one person in this room that, that uh, deserves heaven. Not one person in this room that deserves um, to have a relationship. But God loved you so much that while you were still a sinner, he sent his son Jesus to die for you. The Bible says that, it says that, behold, I stand at your heart's door and I knock. Anyone who hears my voice and opens their door and asks me in, I will come. Doesn't say I might. Doesn't say if you look good or if you act right or if you smell right when you came to the church. It says, I will come in. It's a promise of God. And those of you in this room, if it's one of you, if it's ten of you, I, I just want to have an, a, an opportunity for you to receive Jesus as a personal Lord and Savior. It's a simple prayer, but it's a, it's a heart change. Say, God, I open my heart. I ask you in. I ask that you would forgive my sin. If that's you, I want to pray for you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to stand you up. But if that's you, raise your hand real high right now just so I can see who I'm talking to. Amen. Amen. I see your hands, sir. Anyone else today? Anyone else today? Real quick, real quick. I see your hand, ma'am, right here. Okay, anyone else today? Amen. Appreciate your boldness, ma'am. Yes, I see your hand. Amen. Anyone tell us, Lord, I give my heart to you. Maybe you've backslidden. Maybe you've, you've fallen behind. You say, God, I just want to recommit my life to you. Just lift your hands up right now. I want to make a difference in this world. Amen. Amen, sir, I see you. I see you back there, sir. We're going to pray. Let's all pray. Let's just all pray and believe God for just for a supernatural outpouring of God's spirit in, in, in each and every one of these, these men and women that have committed their life or are committing their life right now. Maybe we can say it together. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. But today I open my heart. Come on, say it nice and loud so I can hear you. Today I open my heart and I invite you in. I ask for forgiveness of my sin. And I choose to make you my Lord and my Savior. From this day forward, I will serve you. Thank you for new life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Can you give God praise for those folks that raise their hand over strong and bold and courageous to make a difference and to change their lives? Amen. Listen, if you did give your heart to the Lord today, I encourage you to make sure that you, you head over to the, uh, to the conference room at the end of, uh, at the end of, of this service at 1230. We will feed you, and we will t tell you a little bit more about God, a little bit more about Jesus. That's, uh, this is week one. Growth track starts at 1230. Put some stuff aside, just like Rob said. Put some stuff aside and, and just spend a few more minutes with us, and uh, we'll feed you, and we'll do that. We're going to go ahead and receive the offering. Guys, come on up. For we're going to pray over it, and uh, God is good, amen? Man, I feel like just going and making my path. Thank you, Rob, for that. That's awesome. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this offering. We ask that you bless it, multiply it, and use it for your glory, Lord, that we would be a city on the hill where its light would shine. In Jesus' name, amen. When the baskets are passed and done, you guys could stand up, and uh, we're going to go ahead and close with one more song. If you are um, in need of prayer, if you desire prayer, the altar workers will come forward, and uh, the prayer uh, warriors will come forward and, and uh, stand in agreement with you in prayer. And uh, but the rest of you, uh, at the end of the song, Brian's going to go ahead and dismiss us. Uh, so.
God is good. Amen? Amen. You guys are dismissed. If you need prayer, uh, you can come up front here with our prayer ministers. But other than that, you guys are dismissed. Have a blessed week.